You're listening to The Vault, a forum communications podcast covering true crime and general intrigue in the upper Midwest. I'm Trisha Terinskis, reading Minnesota's Titanic. The sea wing disaster killed 98, yet the tragedy remains little known. Written by Post Bulletin reporter Matthew Stoley. When Frederick Johnson told his aunt that he was planning to write a history about Minnesota's worst maritime calamity, her reaction was one of disbelief. Well, everybody knows that story. Why would you want to write about that? Her attitude speaks volumes about why the historical memory of the Sea Wing disaster on Lake Pepin extends so little beyond Red Wing, Minnesota, a small river town that suffered the greatest loss of human life from the accident. On July 13, 1890, the steamer Sea Wing was returning from a carnival-like day at a military encampment when it capsized from a sudden and violent storm. Many of the excursionists made the understandable but fateful decision to retreat to the ship's passenger cabin for protection. When the ship flipped over, they were trapped inside the upside-down boat and drowned. 98 passengers nearly half of the people on board, died as they were tossed into or submerged in the churning waters. The sense of tragedy was accentuated by the fact that the day had begun so promisingly. A pleasure cruise down the Mississippi River, from Diamond Bluff to a National Guard encampment at Camp Lakeview near Lake City. Popcorn, lemonade, and ice cream stands had been set up around the encampment, Passengers danced to a four-string band on a barge attached to the steamer's port side as they coasted down the river. The day was cast as the social event of the season, the only discordant note being the warm and humid weather that portended the possibility of foul weather. Of the 57 women on board, 50 of them drowned. Many young women had boarded the ship wearing their Sunday best, Their heavy fabrics and long dresses made swimming nearly impossible, even if they knew how to swim. Whole families died in Lake Pepin's waters. Many were in their teens or early 20s. Some were couples, newlyweds, or days away from marriage. It claimed children and toddlers. Red Wing bore the brunt of the loss. 77 out of the 98 who died came from that city. After the bodies were recovered and the victims identified, Red Wing became a city of mass mourning and grief, holding round after round of funerals and wakes. Survivors bore a lifelong sorrow. Annie Steger, who was 20, and her sister Frances, who was 18, of Florence Township, Minnesota, both perished in the storm. They had been accompanied by two young men, Frank Lapman and Ed Stevens who had tried to save them. Their father, John Steger, was lacerated by heartache for the rest of his life. He would sit and cry, and each day after work, he gazed sorrowfully at his daughter's pictures in the family's best room, recalled Matilda, who was seven at the time and the youngest of the daughters, according to Johnson's book, The Sea Wing Disaster, Tragedy on Lake Pepin. It forever altered the trajectory of families' lives, stricken with grief as they were. William Blaker lost his wife and two children, and within days of burying them, put up his house in the west end of Red Wing for sale. Sarah Adams of Trenton lost three children, two nieces and a nephew, turning her coal black hair to gray around her face. During the recovery of the bodies, relatives held out hope that their loved ones had survived. Eliza Crawford, an Ohio native who had moved to Goodhue County to teach, was one of the missing in the days after the incident. She had told family members how much she enjoyed teaching those Norwegian boys and girls and had just completed her first month of teaching. Her uncle, H.W. Keller, refrained from informing the family about her possible death then wrote a letter while she was still missing. Here's what the letter said. There were whole families lost. 
As far as I know, there were only five females saved. There were life preservers on the boat, but few availed themselves of them. There is mourning in Red Wing, as nearly all of them were from here. She was later discovered among the drowning victims. It has been referred to as Minnesota's Titanic story. Yet for such a shattering, life-searing event that reverberated across the nation, it is easy to wonder why the history isn't better known beyond Red Wing. Many beyond the city's immediate vicinity are often surprised when they first hear about it. By the time Johnson began his research into the Sea Wing mishap in the early 1980s, he was perhaps a generation removed from being forgotten. When he began combing the Minnesota Historical Society's archives, the only document he could find was a commemorative blanket in memory of those who perished. It was prepared for a July 13, 1890 memorial ceremony in Red Wing. Johnson's aunt's disbelief that he wanted to write a book about the Sea Wing also held implications for that history. The older generations were all familiar with the accident, the worst accident in terms of lives lost in Minnesota history. But as the generation died off, it became less well-known, although never completely erased. It was no small feat assembling a narrative from the conflicting stories as reported by the media at the time. The Twin Cities media often sensationalized the incident, often reporting whispered rumors as fact. The horror-filled event needed no exaggeration, yet their headlines were often over-the-top and tabloid-like. A voyage of pleasure that ended on the shores of another world, screamed one. Local media closer to the event tended to report more responsibly. Many of the conflicting narratives centered on the ship's pilot and co-owner, Dan Weathern. He had steered the ship into the straight-line winds as he was supposed to, but in the event's aftermath, he was dogged by questions about his judgment and conduct. One of the biggest questions was why Weathern chose to hazard a return along the Mississippi with the weather looking so threatening. Still, most people got on the boat. Inspectors eventually charged Weathern with unskillfulness, particularly his decision to start out in the face of an approaching storm and failing to hug Minnesota's shoreline, where there were many harbors for protection. Still, Weathern was not without allies, and he was an object of sympathy. He had lost his wife and a child in the accident. This charitable view was reflected in the fact that in the aftermath, Weathern remained a figure of social standing. He wasn't treated as a pariah. He stayed active in fraternal organizations in Red Wing and Prescott, in Diamond Bluff, where he lived and where the ill-fated excursion of the Sea Wing began, he served as a town board chairman and treasurer. He remarried. Life moved on. For photos and a video related to this event, check out our print story. You can find that at inforum.com. Just look for the Vault section. You've been listening to The Vault, a forum communications podcast covering true crime and general intrigue from the upper Midwest. Unlock more cold cases and crimes from the past at inforum.news slash try. Get your first three months of unlimited access to our entire news network for only 99 cents a month. Visit inforum.news slash try to take advantage of this deal. Forum Communications is proud to be part of The Trust Project. Learn more at thetrustproject.org.